Good evening and welcome. Tonight we are doing our next country in my Countries of the World series. And tonight we are exploring Serbia. It's right here. Now, Serbia, <laughs> how should I put this kindly? Um, I said in other videos, sort of a controversial country. I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad country. It sounds wonderful from what I've seen in my research. Um, it seems like a lovely country. It seems like they really want a reputation of being like a party country. <laughs> um, it's the people there seem very lovely. It looks beautiful. The countryside looks gorgeous. Belgrade is beautiful. The capital city right there. Uh, but its history is full of a lot of turmoil. Um, a lot of, um, you know, this is a relaxation video. And it's full of a lot of things that aren't relaxing. As I've done with other countries in my series, I'll try to cover them in the most relaxing way possible. And it's it's not that I'm trying to um, play off certain events or belittle certain events or put down other countries. <laughs> I'm trying to be inclusive and kind. I'm talking to you, Croatia and Bosnia and Albania and Kosovo down here. <laughs> all you guys over here in former Yugoslavia. Um, that's why I'm not covering it. That's why I'm not going like this, you know. I don't want someone in the comments, some angry Croatian being like, hey, we're some angry Albanian, you know. Even though I know, um, you know, modern times and most young people don't care about those kind of old rivalries, I know. I still want to be sensitive, you know, to, to everyone. Um, but, yeah. It's a, it's a long, complicated history, and we're going to start off with geography, which is also very complicated in, for Serbia, because, um, as you can see, Serbia, as of 2020, is now landlocked, to let you know how complicated this is. It currently borders Hungary, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, the disputed territory of Kosovo, Macedonia, I'm sorry, North Macedonia, this map is kind of old, Bulgaria, and Romania. Um, we're gonna get into Kosovo in a minute. Let's just put a pin in that. That's where the controversy comes in. Um, most of the border up here and over here is made by the Danube River, which you know, flows down through here cuts across halfway through Serbia, flows through Belgrade, and makes up the border here between Romania, which, um, right along here is where that, um, scary face that <laughs> jump scared me in my last video, <laughs> where I flipped through that atlas is. Um, and technically the Danube is the longest river in Serbia, but the longest river that flows completely through Serbia is the Morava River that flows straight down this way. So, um, Serbia is kind of cut into two different terrains up here in what we would call Vojvodina. You can see right there, so Vojvodina. It's very flat, perfect for farmland. Serbia grows a lot of berries. Um, and the rivers, of course, make it prime farmland. I, I didn't write down the statistic, but I think it said 10% of the population of Serbia is involved in the farming industry uh, to some extent. So lots and lots of farmland up here. And then this half of Serbia is very mountainous. Um, not like, you know, like giant, giant, giant mountains, but mountains nonetheless. Not like, you know, like the Alps or Nothing huge, but, you know, mountains are mountains. Um, and it includes the Balkan Mountains, you can see right here, uh, which the Balkan region is named after Serbia as part of the Balkans. Um, this whole region is known as the Balkans, which Greece, Bulgaria, we'll get into all the other countries later. Um, so, 
and down here we have Kosovo. So, um, the Serbian people do not recognize Kosovo as an independent country. They consider Kosovo part of Serbia. Um, most of the world considers Kosovo its own independent nation. Kosovo declared independence. Um, we'll get into it more in the history. So, um, it's not officially recognized by the UN, so it's a disputed territory, so it's kind of hard to say, you know, if this is Serbia or not, but, um, you know, I'll just leave it at that. You know, I don't want to be too controversial. I'm just going to deliver the facts, so. Um, but yeah, overall, that's the basic geography of Serbia. I'll show you more pictures in this book. Um, <laughs> in this book was written in 1999 which um, if you know the history of this region it's severely outdated if it was written in 1999 holy moly like outrageously so it's like it would be like um getting like a history book for the u.s and it was written like before the civil war <laughs> it's outrageously outdated but uh, the pictures are still beautiful so, I'll show you a lot more geography stuff inside this book. It's kind of hard to show you with a more political map, but um, it's a beautiful country. Uh, but I want to dive into the history because the history is really fascinating, really, really neat. And it starts off um, with one of the oldest, not one of the oldest, the oldest um, site in Europe with evidence of... Um, Homo sapiens, I believe. Well, it has a picture of it in this book also. Um, it's like the oldest uh, signs of actual human, not like a settlement, not like a town, you know, but evidence of human life getting together and making things, you know. Um, not just like caveman banging on rocks or making art, but actually, you know, living like human beings happened here in Serbia. So the um, oldest tribes we found evidence of lived around this area, around 6500, yeah, 6500 BCE, sorry. I just doubted myself and I was like, wait, no, yeah. Um, but actually it was when the Celtic tribes moved in and established um, some towns in what is now Belgrade, what is now Niche. Um, around the 5th and 2nd centuries BCE that this area really started to develop. Um, and then the Romans came and conquered this region, and um, that's when things really took off. Um, they established the province of Illyria, um, and it thrived. It, it was a beautiful region. They, um, you know, it was, it was perfect. Um, lots of Future Roman emperors were born here, including Emperor Constantine, who was, you know, the first Christian Roman emperor. Um, you know, which becomes a, a point of pride later on. You'll see why. Um, and it it really thrived, and that is evident in how when Rome divided in half in 395 into like a Western Roman Empire and Eastern Roman Empire. This would have been the Eastern. Um, the Eastern Roman Empire was far more stronger, more powerful than the Western. The Eastern Roman Empire was more commonly known as the Byzantine Empire, because Byzantium was the capital of Byzantium. It's later known as Constantinople, after Constantine, um, which was then later known as Istanbul. So Byzantium really thrived. It was the last great moment of the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman Empire, at least, um, of how it used to be. Uh, and um, it was then that the Serbs came in. Now, I really tried um, to figure out where white Serbia was because, you know, I usually start off the series with where, where the name of the country comes from. So obviously Serbia means land of the Serbs, right? So it was, well, where did the Serbs come from? The Serbs were a tribe of Slavs 
that hailed from white Serbia. So I'm like, okay, well, where's white Serbia? Why was it called white Serbia? I went down a rabbit hole, right? So most things I found said that white Serbia was near Francia, which is obviously France today, but I also found some sources that said it was more in like the northeast of Europe, you know, where most Slavic tribes came from. Um, and then I found a source that was from Constantinople that said that white Serbia was, um, like, if I think it said, like, I didn't write it down also. It said it was far from Turkey. So, what does that mean? <laughs> so, I, I assume it was up in that northernish region of Europe. But they migrated down into this region and more of the Dalmatia region over here and started settling and built farms and liked this place a lot and made families, made farms, made communities and like I usually say in my series, when you start making communities, you start needing people to lead those communities and when you have leaders running communities, you get, you know, kings and stuff and slowly but surely they developed, you know, a statehood and um, around 870 they discovered Christianity and thought that it was awesome and really ran with it and slowly their reign spread across this region they kind of like developed kind of like all around here it was like their place about they, they really spread out um, by 1116, they had a full-fledged kingdom, and it was the Nemanjic dynasty. I'm so sorry if I said that wrong. And um, to the Serbs, this was their golden era. To them, still today, they consider this their golden era. Um, their king um, and his two sons were, um, I mean, he's a saint today. They built monasteries, churches, um, they were beloved, beloved rulers, um, and, you know, put their, not just like their, their land, their territory, but like their heritage, their religion, their way of life on the map. It was a real point of pride to them. And, um, you know, the, the places that they built, the, the land, I think it's like on the cover, yeah, like on the cover of this book, the places that they created are still standing today and are still a point of pride for the Serbs, you know. Um, so that the Nemanjic dynasty uh, lasted from 1116 to 1371. And um, that came to an end uh, when the Ottomans came, so. The Ottomans, of course, had taken over Turkey. They were ruling from down there. It was now, you know, Istanbul. And um, they were Muslim. It was their big claim. And of course, the, the Serbs up here were very, very Christian. So they came up this way, knocking at the door, ready to expand their empire. And it really came to a head on June 15th, 1389, at the Battle of Kosovo. And it was a huge battle. It was, it's still considered like one of the biggest days for Serbs in Serbia, like um, their darkest day, honestly, considering like everything that's happened in Serbia since, honestly. Um, because it, it, and again, it wasn't just, you know, a battle of, you know, it wasn't just another battle. It wasn't just territory. It was like, Christianity versus Islam. It was a national identity versus, you know, this incoming, uh, this people who didn't know them, these intruders, you know. It was their way of life, their identity, their culture, their religion, everything was at stake. Um, and they were defeated in a big way. So, um, one of the reasons why Serbia really treasures the whole Kosovo region is that not only were some of the um, Nemanjic dynasty buildings in this region that they treasure, but it 
it's also where, obviously, where the Battle of Kosovo took place. Um, it's, you know, a big part of their cultural heritage. So, the Serbs lost their land, and the Ottomans officially spread and took over all of their land by 1459. And, um, they very heavily persecuted the Serbs, uh, forced them to convert, um, not all of them, but, you know, whenever there was an opportunity to force someone to convert, the Ottomans took it. Um, they ensurfed them, which means that, you know, they, they were forced to be serfs. <laughs> um, and they, they just weren't treated very well. And to make this short, because this is not going to be a big deep dive, um, up here, you know, you see Hungary up here. Up here we had Austria-Hungary. And if you've seen my Czech Republic video, you know all about the Habsburgs. So when the Habsburgs came into power, you know, they didn't want the Ottomans knocking on their door soon. So they, you know, wanted the, this whole threat gone. And, um, wars started between the Ottomans and the Austria-Hungary Empire, the Habsburgs. And that started about the early 1500s, like 1520, and lasted till about the 1790s. And the Serbs were just caught in the middle. Um, the Serbs basically crowded the Vojvodin area because the, uh, the, the Habsburgs sorry, um, would say things like, Hey, you know, come up here, we'll give you a safe place to live. And they would, and then the Ottomans would take it over, and then they would, you know, try to find another safe place. and. It was a huge back and forth where they didn't have a land, they didn't really have an identity, they didn't have a writing. Um, you know, it was a it was a rough time for the Serbs, and you know, 1790s, because I said it ended around the 1790s. What was happening in Europe around then? I think um, the the French Revolution had happened. Um, you know, a lot of radical ideas were swirling around Europe of um, you know democracy. Even communism was kind of stirring around, thoughts like that. Um, you know, progressivism, moving away from empires and monarchies and governments run by the people. So the Serbians were kind of getting some ideas. And the first Serbian war for independence started in 1804 when the Serbians said, enough is enough, we're going to take back our land and we're going to kick out the Ottomans. And the first war lasted from 1804 to 1813, and the Serbians were successful. And they, um, you know, defeated the Ottomans and held on to their independence for, um, a few years until, like, a year and a half later, the Ottomans just, like, came back and reclaimed their land. They <laughs> reoccupied. They were like, okay, that's enough independence. We're coming back. The Serbians said, well, no, we're being serious, and they started the second revolution in 1850. Um, the Ottomans realized they were being serious. They came to a compromise, and they achieved full autonomy from the Ottomans by 1830, and had drafted the first constitution on February 15th, 1835. And it was the first democratic constitution in Europe awesome. Um, it didn't really last long though because by 1882 it was all kind of thrown out to create a like a monarchy, the Kingdom of Serbia. But anyway, um, the first thing that Serbia did with independence was start wars. And I'm gonna kind of gloss over this chapter in their history because oh boy did they war. They fought. The first thing they did was declare war on the Ottoman Empire. Okay. The first thing they did was declare war on the Ottoman Empire. Um, they declared, I think they declared war on the Bosnians. Um, and with each successful war, they managed to gain more territory. If they lost the war, they would just declare war again. And this lasted until, like, into the 1900s, it was, um, okay, it was kind of a lot, it was kind of extra, um, I don't know what's happening outside, so, 
Meanwhile, Austria-Hungary up here, this big empire up here, is watching Serbia because, again, neighbors. And they're kind of worried because Serbia is just declaring wars left and right and um, doesn't want that to happen <laughs> up here. So they had put in place what they called the policy of patience and just kind of kept an eye on Serbia and just watched them very carefully in case something happened. <laughs> so um, during this time, like I said, I'm not really going to go over the nitty gritty of what happened during the wars. All you need to know is that Serbia managed to gain a lot more territory than they had when they had declared independence and that they had managed to become best friends with Russia during all this. <laughs> That's all you need to know. Um, and that Austria-Hungary was kind of worried about them. <laughs> and um, they, they were right for a reason because something did happen. <laughs> On June 28th, 1914, in Sarajevo, <laughs> one small moment changed the course of human history when a Serb named Gavrilo Princip noticed a car with Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary driving by and shot him and killed him. So, um, Austria-Hungary was like, whoa, okay, like, that's enough, Serbia. Like, you've crossed the line now. Like, enough of the patience. We're going to declare war on you. Like, you got to stop. You got to chill. And Russia was like, whoa, 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 hold on, like, you're declaring war on little Serbia for that, like, first of all, first of all, Serbia is a little country, they're brand new, they're new at this, their monarchy's a little shaky, they're still figuring things out, that's kind of rude for you to just decide to declare war on them like that over one, like, it was one guy. It wasn't like an army marched in and killed your archduke. It was just one guy. Um, it, it doesn't seem right. So you know what? We are going to declare war on you. And Austria-Hungary's best friend was Germany. And Germany was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Russia, what are you doing? You can't just declare war on Austria-Hungary like that because they declared, they rightfully declared war on Serbia. Like, that's extreme. Like, you need to chill down. Like, that's really outlandish. Like, so we're going to declare war on you and Serbia. To which Great Britain was like, guys, you need to chill out. Because Russia's right. Like, Austria-Hungary is nuts over this. Germany, we've been looking for a reason to declare a war on you anyway. We're going to war. And everyone just declared war on each other. Thus, World War I happened, or the Great War. Yeah. Um, European countries were pulling stuff like this all the time for centuries. My cat's drinking water. That's what that sound is in the background. European countries, superpowers, kingdoms, empires and whatnot. We're doing this for centuries, right? Like declaring wars over things like this. Um, but the difference now was that the technology of the time had created weapons that were absolutely devastating. And hundreds of thousands of people died as a result of this war. And actually Serbia had the highest, um, casualty rate in Europe. Um, it was horrendous. The Great War was a tragedy across Europe. Um, to which, you know, Europe is still, I wouldn't say recovering from, but still reeling from today. Um, so, you know, Europe in the aftermath reeled back and realized what had happened and realized that, like, we can't declare wars over things like that anymore. Like, that needs to stop. And, you know, sweeping changes were made to how wars and politics could happen in Europe and around the world after that. Cat's now safely in the lab if you can hear him purring. Oh yeah, you can hear him purring. So, 
so um, in 1918, when the war was over, um, a, a lot of discussion was made about what was going to happen to this region, since it was so devastated. And, oh my god, it's so loud. What they decided was to just let a lot of countries absorb into Serbia. Um, and, um, there's a lot of problems with this because, you know, all of these countries are different ethnic groups, like, um, and they, they don't really, like, they have a lot of similarities, but they also have a lot of differences historically, um, and it doesn't work very well. Um, there were a lot, <laughs> my kitty, there were a lot of disagreements on how the government should be ran. So, at this point, there is still a kingdom, um, but they had also set up like a parliament system. So, kind of like how like the UK is today with a like a royal family and a parliament, but it was like 50-50. Um, and there were a lot of issues. I mean, at one point, their king was assassinated. Um, and it was just all really falling apart. And um, at one point, their king just completely gave up, trashed the idea of a parliament, and created a full-on dictatorship in 1929. Said, you know what, forget the whole concept of uniting all these lands. We're just going to 100% absorb them, create a whole new country, and we're going to call it Yugoslavia. Instead of just having all these ethnic groups just you know, having their own representation, we're just all going to be the same. And we're all going to be, you know, Yugoslavian. Um, then World War II happens, which is never good. Um, Yugoslavia declared themselves neutral. They were not going to get involved. Um, but the Axis powers had other ideas, and they invaded anyway. And they set up a puppet government for Croatia. And they had decided that along with rounding up any Jews or Romani or homosexuals or any other ethnic group that they decided to persecute, they were going to add Serbians to the list. And um, it was very devastating for the Serbians in Yugoslavia. And they set up many concentration camps in this region. And, um, yeah, <laughs> a lot of dark things happened we're just not going to get into because this is a very relaxing channel and very relaxing history. So, um, many different, um, like, civil war groups popped up. And um, one of them was a communist group led by a man named Josip Broz Tito. And... His group wound up being the most successful one because the communist Russians were the one to liberate Yugoslavia. And he wound up becoming the leader of the new government. He set up a one-party communist system to run Yugoslavia. And um, what Tito set up was really interesting. Um, he established a non-aligned communist government. So, um, he did not establish ties with Stalin or the, um, USSR. He did not establish ties with the United States. So, um, they very clearly did not pick sides in the Cold War. They did not want to have any kind of communist, um, allies. They were just neutral. Which, ultimately, in the long run, was probably extremely, extremely smart of Tito. Because, um, otherwise they would have wound up being some kind of target for the United States at some point, so. So, Tito's reign, you know, was, um, I think good for Yugoslavia at the time. It's really what it needed just to get it kicking. Um, 
second, like the last thing that it needed was someone to bring it all down. And that's exactly what happened in 1989 when Slobodan Milosevic rose to power and said, like, what if we just did a genocide? What if we just like genocided everyone who wasn't Serbian? And people were like, no. And he was like, well, what about, what if we did? So <laughs> that was awful of me. I apologize. But um, we're actually going to talk about Bosnia and Herzegovina in two weeks, I think. So um, we're going to talk about the Yugoslav Wars in more detail then because it's really their war to discuss. Um, but let me just state that the Yugoslav War happened from 1991 to 2001. Um, it was led by Slobodan Milosevic, who was Serbian, even though he was the leader of Yugoslavia. He was extremely pro-Serbian and very anti-every other ethnic group within Yugoslavia, except for the Serbs. Uh, there were many, many protests against him. At one point, the um, Kosovo Liberation Army um, in 1998 led to the UN coming in and... Um, administering control of the Kosovo province. So that's when they first kind of had their own taste of independence away from the rest of Serbia and Yugoslavia. Um, in 2000, I'm trying to gloss over this quickly because we're being relaxing. And again, we're going to address this in a lot more detail when we talk about Bosnia and Herzegovina. Because again, it's their story to tell, honestly. It affected this country more than any other. Um, in 2000, they held an election, and um, Slobodan Milosevic came out way on top, which obviously was not right. Um, the the people declared an election fraud. There were mass protests, and it forced Milosevic to step down. And um, he was sent to an international criminal tribunal in The Hague. Um, where he actually died before he could complete his war crimes trial for um, genocide against the Bosnians and other ethnic groups in Yugoslavia. So, um, by that point, all these other countries had declared independence except for Montenegro. So, um, the, the country had renamed themselves to Serbia, Montenegro. Um, and this is when they had started to try to gain admittance to the EU. Um, but I, I believe the EU requires, well, I mean, a lot of standards to enter. One of which being, like, you have to be a stable country. And I feel like every time they entered in, like, you know, a request, some kind of assassination or explosion would happen. And um, it just wouldn't look good, but, um, they did eventually, um, when was it? I didn't write it down. I think it was in 2012 they finally got a notice that they would be considered, and then 2014 was when, like, official talks started, but I don't think anything's happened since then, and I know they're not a member as of now, but, um, they are trying. <laughs> then in... Um, on May 21st, 2006, in Montenegro, they held a referendum vote to see if they should become an independent nation, and it passed with over 50%, and Serbia said, sure, why not? So Montenegro became an independent nation. Then on February 17th, 2008, Kosovo declared independence, and Serbia said, no, you can't do that. And, um, it takes all five of the UN superpowers to declare an independent nation. And China and Russia do not recognize Kosovo, and they are two of the five. So Kosovo remains in limbo, where most of the world sees them as an independent nation, and some countries don't, like the countries that matter, like Serbia, Russia, and China and um, any other country that allies itself with Serbia, Russia, and China don't recognize Kosovo as an independent nation. Um, 
and that's currently where we stand. Currently, um, Serbia's president, um, Alexander, I think it's Vicic, I believe. Anyway, um, he's very conservative and he's very buddy-buddy with other conservative world leaders of our time. I think you all know who we're talking about, um, especially the one that kind of lives that way, in that big, cold country up there. Um, but yeah, there's been lots of protests, especially in 2019, against his um, really conservative policies, especially against journalists. Like a lot of conservative leaders have been doing recently. But that is pretty much where Serbia is in the world. I just checked there. Um, their COVID numbers, and, um, it was, like, low, 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 and then, like, late October, was like, shoo. So, that's where Serbia is today. Let's look at the nice book. This very old book, and look at some pretty pictures. Now, I'm gonna mispronounce some things. I looked up some things. I've probably forgotten how to pronounce them. <laughs> I've been kind of sick, not sick, but just unwell these past few days, so I've probably forgotten how to pronounce them, so I do apologize if you're Serbian, and, um, <laughs> just please correct me in the comments. I don't take corrections as offensive or mean or anything. I take them as, um, helpful and, you know, something to help me learn. Monastery, and there is Jesus, looking very, showing you his book. Check this out. Here's a map of Serbia in 1999. <laughs> so you can see Vojvodina, you can see Kosovo there, Central Serbia. Belgrade, advertising a Tina Turner concert. This is in Kosovo, which um, we will do a Kosovo episode, don't worry. Definitely will. Farmers east of Belgrade driving a horse and wagon from the mountains to the valleys. Very pretty. Look at this beautiful woods. Oh, this makes me want to go hiking. It's a beautiful tree. I'm telling you, this countryside is gorgeous. Look at this. Oh. Almost looks like, um, like Napa, like Northern California, but, um, so much more picturesque. The little cart. Here you can see more of the mountains. You can see more what I was talking about at the beginning, how you can see it's so flat, and, you know, the great Hungarian plain here, and then all of these mountains down here, how mountainous it is. Oh, I didn't say the mountains, so this is, this is currently the highest point in Serbia proper. It's, um, oh, see, I forgot how to pronounce this, Midjur, and then this is the highest point in Kosovo, and it's, um, Tarifika, but it would have been the highest point in Serbia if Kosovo was still technically a part of it. Fragrant Linden. Let's see. It's a good tea for relieving colds. Sounds good. I've been drinking a lot of tea lately. Oh my gosh. So when I first checked this book out and I flipped through it real quick, I saw this picture and I was like, great. Went to the store and I bought like a ton of fruit. So now my fridge is full of like fruit because I like went to the produce section and bought a ton of grapes. And then I was like, well, I want some bananas since bananas are on sale. And I bought a ton of bananas and then I bought a ton of oranges. <laughs> I bought so much fruit. I have all this fruit, but oh well. Not a problem. It's the opposite of a problem, I like to say. Some birds on the open marsh. Farm field. Hope you don't have allergies. Look 
at this big old haystack. Like bigger than the house. Beautiful woods. Let's see. Looks so peaceful. Those leaves look so crunchy. Here's the chair top gorge. Where the iron gate is, where that creepy face was. <laughs> Jump scare. Here's Belgrade. City. The big old boats. Ships, I should say. Look at this building. It's a sum of Serbia's architects design spectacular modern buildings. It's a neat big spiral building. Even a little spiral building on this side. That's so neat. Big old sheeps. Oh, fluffy. Look at Serbia City. So this is Pristina and Kosovo. And it's neat, you can see there's a mosque right there. So there's still a lot of remnants of the Ottoman Empire left in Serbia and Kosovo. Still a lot of Muslims as well, even though, you know, Christianity is... Oh, I shook the camera. A lot is still very popular. And there's Sobotica, I believe you've pronounced. Slayer ride. Oh, animals. Now we've got a pine marten. A wild boar with its baby piggies. And a beautiful red fox. We've got some birds. We have a partridge, or two partridges. And a jay. And some mushrooms. And we've got some. more sheeps. And here is the Serbian flag by a little child. So it says, the national symbol of Serbia is the double-headed white eagle. An ancient artistic creation. It appears on Serbia's coat of arms. The symbol comes from the Nemanja dynasty, a royal family that expanded Serbian territory in the 12th century. This mythical eagle is thought to be the king of animals. Serbia has no official flower, national flower, but people of the Bosher or red peony. Legend has it that the flower turned from white to red because of the bloodshed during the Battle of Kosovo. See, I told you that's like a big deal still in Serbia. Serbia began. Oh, so this is what I was telling you about. This is Lipinski Fear. The early signs of life of Serbia. The area along the Danube River. Lipinski Fear culture developed here. 7 and 6,000 BC. One of the most important prehistoric sites in Europe. Turkish conquest of Constantinople. Golubak Fortress. Looks like it's like out of Game of Thrones. Well, I mean, it was filmed in Croatia, so a little far. Next to the Iron Gate Gorge, you that creepy face. The Balkans in the 11th and 15th centuries. So you can see the Byzantine Empire. The Roman and Latin Empires are down here and up there. The Ottomans stretched this far. In the 1390s and by 1480 it had gone all the way up to there. You can see Belgrade right there. And the Danube River. of Serbia. So like I was telling you, the Serbs, you know, came down and slowly started spreading out and just like, just started taking over all this land. So here's Saint Sava and Saint Simeon, who was um, the first king and his youngest son who became saints and very beloved to the Serbian people. And here's the, one of the monasteries that the king built. It's now um, Saint Simeon. The Kosovo Maiden. Milos of Brnovich, like the battle that freed Serbia from Turkish domination. The great fighters in the revolution. 
Congress of Berlin. Let's see, that one was, um, let's see. Oh yeah, so that was like um, when Austria first started to get really suspicious about Serbia. There's Franz Ferdinand getting shot. Yugoslavia in 1929. Let's see, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Macedonia, Serbia. So here's the king I was telling you about that was assassinated. It says his picture was taken just before he was killed in Marseille, France. And a photograph of one of the freedom fighters. This was the Chetniks, I believe. Um, one of the freedom fighting groups that, um, you know, didn't quite rise to power because, you know, Tito's group was more favorable. You can see just how beloved Tito was in Yugoslavia. This was his birthday. Balkans today. <laughs> Gonna ignore that. Kind of out of order. <laughs> out of order. Outdated. Men wounded in Yugoslavia civil war await their evacuation. Date of breakup. We'll kind of gloss over this because it's really outdated. Belgrade, a little map of Belgrade. This is established by Celtic tribe. By the Skordiski Celtic tribe. There's Slobodan Milosevic. Oh. Money, money, money. Must be funny. Receiving free bread in Belgrade. What's up on the line? Yugoslavian money. We just saw this guy. Literally that exact same picture. And there's Nikola Tesla. We're gonna see him tomorrow. Horse sharing. say CDs, but I guess they had CDs back then, right? 99? Yeah, they had CDs. Violin maker. Fatina. You can very carefully learn violin. A beautiful cow. Absolutely lovely looking cow. Going skiing. Very 90s clothes. Oh, how beautiful. And Topola. The Church of St. George. Beautiful mosaics. How lovely. Who lives in Serbia? Lots of Serbs, but lots of other ethnic groups as well. The alphabet. We'll get to that in a few days. <laughs> oh, so this is, um, let's see, it was um, Cyril and Methodius. One of the great um, things that Serbians pride themselves on was that. Um, Serbia was the birthplace of the Cyrillic alphabet. We'll learn more of that in a few days. Oh, how sweet. There's always cute kids in these books, isn't there? Always cute kids. Very serious men. Older Albanian men in Kosovo often wear small white caps. Here's just some men having some coffee. Traditions, faith, and folk tales. Oh. Celebrating Easter. The most somber Orthodox way, apparently. Lighting candles during the Feast of the Assumption. And St. Sava. And here we are praying in Pristina, Kosovo. And young women studying the Quran at a mosque in like I said, the, the Islamic faith is still ooh, that looks yummy, yum, yum. It's still very prominent because of the Ottoman influence. It's a beautiful wedding with the bridal moors. That looks fun. Painting. Let's 
sake of Jesus Christ, open knock. If I'm saying that right, I'm probably not. Another beautiful painting. Beautiful eggs. Textiles. And a Nobel Prize winner, Evo Andre. is a goosla musical instrument with the eagle on top dancing a lot of fun you can tell <laughs> oh, we've all been here we've all been at this table <laughs> the crying baby the grandparents we've all been there Basketball, Yugoslavia took home a silver medal for basketball. 96 Olympics. Remember when we used to be able to do this? <laughs> I remember when we used to be able to do this. Let's see. Alexandra Ivoshev. She was off her gold medal. And rifle shooting. Those are small sausages. Those are huge. Ooh, that looks delicious. Look at his hat. <laughs> anyway, I think this is the end because the food's always at the very end of these books. Let's see. Yep. The timeline. And all this outdated information because this is an ancient book. So anyway. Serbia. So. <laughs> Thank you for watching. And... I hope you learned something today, and I hope this was very relaxing. Thank you so much for watching, and have a good night.